We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good evening. Uh, it's exactly half past, uh, which is the official start of today's session. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you all here today and also to have an opportunity to be your moderators throughout the session, uh, where we're going to address the bunch of very interesting topics touching upon regulating big tech and its relation to the protection of fundamental rights and freedom with the emph emphasis on freedom of expression. Uh, my name is Eliška Pirkova. I work for Access Now as a Global Freedom of Expression Lead and Europe Policy Analyst, and I will be your moderator today. Today's session that is being organized by the Council of Europe uh, is uh, having a format of the Open Forum, and its title is Free Expression and Digitalization Compatibility Mode. And under this headline, there is truly a lot of topics to unpack. We will walk you through quite a few today, thanks to our distinguished speakers that will be soon uh, presenting their individual contribution. Uh, but perhaps it's also important to emphasize that the main background and uh, what really informed today's, um, uh, today's session is freshly published guidance notes, which was adopted by the Steering Committee for Media and Information Society at the Council of Europe. Uh, um, that gathers best practices towards effective legal and procedural framework for self-regulation as well as co-regulation mechanisms of content moderation. The guidance note touches upon a number of important issues from um, how to actually design the regulation and the content moderation that is daily exercised by very large online platforms, but also by smaller players in the human rights compliant manner. It touches upon several essential fundamental rights from freedom of expression, which is, of course, an obvious right uh, directly impacted by those practices, but it also addresses issues related to right to privacy, as freedom of assembly and association, uh, which are less explored fundamental rights in the connection to digital uh, technologies. Um, I think that further details about the guiding note will be shared with, by our speakers. And so I will now introduce a very impressive lineup of experts who dedicate significant time of their, uh, in their professional uh, focus to this topic. First of all, it's Mr. Yoichi Ida, who is Deputy Director General for G7 and G20 Relations at the Japanese Institute of Internal, Internal Affairs and Communication. He previously chaired G7 Working Meeting on ICT Policy when Japan hosted G7 ICT Ministers Meeting and proposed international discussion on guidelines on artificial intelligence that was then developed in 2016. And artificial intelligence or automated decision-making processes have a lot to do with the topic of content moderation. It's a great pleasure to have with us today. The next is Professor Natalie Halberger, who doesn't even need to be introduced when we discuss the topic of regulation of online platforms. She is also the chair of the Council of Europe of Expert Group on AI and Freedom of Expression, that is actually out, author of the guidance note. And she is a professor of law and digital technology, with a specific focus on AI at the University of Amsterdam. Natalie is very well known in the policy world of internet regulation and advises on a regular basis number of uh, international organizations and policy bodies. Then it's Dr. Matthias Ketman, who is the head of the research program uh, at Leibniz Institute for Media Research and Hans Breidhoff Institute. Matthias published a number of expert publications on the topic of content governance, freedom of expression, and regulation of big tech, and um, will be uh, de definitely a significant contribution to today's panel. And finally, Ms. Kathleen Stewart, who is a public policy manager and expert on content regulation at Facebook, more mainly in the Europe, the Middle East, and Africa region. Previously, she was the head of international broadcast policy at the UK Department for Digital Culture, Media, and Sport. She was also responsible for overseeing audiovisual media policy, and as well as negotiation and further implementation of the audiovisual media services directive of the European Union. Um, so 
without uh, any undue delay, uh, I would like to now introduce uh, our first speaker, and that's Professor Natalie uh, Helberger, to uh, introduce today's topic, mainly the guidance note, and uh, open the session with her contribution. Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for, uh, for organizing this session on, on a really important topic, especially now that we see that regulators at national and European and international level are developing their strategies and laying down the rules and procedures for responsible content moderation and use of recommendation systems. So, um, and thank you also for the opportunity to report about the work uh, we have been doing with amazing experts at this Council of Europe Committee on Freedom of Expression and the Impact of Digital Technologies, MSI DIG, which I had the honor to chair. Um, and where these questions were really central. So, and as you mentioned already, uh, Eliska, the uh, MSA DIG adopted a guidance note with very concrete recommendations for the effective legal procedure frameworks for content moderation, um, including a, a range of very concrete and practical recommendations of how to take the fundamental rights perspective on board, and also, um, characteristics of successful and failed approaches on content moderation, which I think is also really useful in developing strategies moving forwards. Um, the MSI DIG also uh, adapted a um, draft recommendation on the impact of digital technology on freedom of expression, where it formulates principles aimed at ensuring that digital technologies serve rather than curtail Article 10. Um, and why it would be, um, yeah, would, would go way beyond my five minutes to um, explain the entire um, scope of the recommendations that the guidance and recommendation do. I would like to focus on or highlight three of them. Um, I think an important approach for both the recommendation and guidance note is a focus on procedures, on the procedures through which intermediaries rank, moderate, and remove content rather than banning undesirable speech such as disinformation um, as doing the latter is at odds with freedom expression, especially when couched in vague terms that are subject to interpretation. And I think that is an important recommendation in the light of the fact that we have seen, especially now in the wake of the pandemic, a considerable regulatory activity at the national level to fight COVID disinformation um, and some of these um, laws were um, actually prioritizing speedy removal over proportional and graduate responses and procedural safeguard for freedom expression. So I think this is really important point of departure um, of, 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 of the work of the MSI DIG. The second focus is on meaningful transparency and the focus here is really on meaningful. Because I mean, we all talk about transparency and we also all know that there's far too much information out there further burdening the consumer rather than truly empowering them. Um, and something that both the guidance note and also the recommendation use is to highlight out that for transparency to be really meaningful for users, it needs to be not only accompanied by media literacy initiatives, but also a true choice that enables users to decide for or against being profiled and also being able to ex exercise control, not only on the, on the data and interferences, but also which content they get to see. So this focus on uh, transparency is only meaningful if it's accompanied by true choice and agency. And the third point um, I would like to highlight is that um, both works acknowledge the fact that upholding freedom of expression in the digital environment is not exclusively and simply a problem of responsible content moderation, but it's also a structural problem that requires structural solutions. Um, and that is very much related to the overall health of the public communication space and the existing of a flourishing ecosystem of diverse media players that can act as trusted sources of information that can help people distinguish between disinformation and verified fact-check news, but also that can um, avoid that an over-reliance on, on, on social media platforms as the main or even sole source of information. And I believe that um, with these recommendations, the MSI DIG, um, provides very important guidance that goes beyond 
um, some of the um, approaches that we have seen and really adds some to the approaches that we're seeing right now on the table. And if you like, I would like, uh, I could expand on that in the discussion of um, where the, um, I believe these two documents go beyond um, the current state of uh, the art. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Natalie. Uh, I think that was an excellent summary. Uh, and definitely putting emphasis on the processes and systems that platforms deploy on a regular basis instead of combating concrete categories of content is definitely the right uh, approach to go ahead. Uh, and it's also in line with the efforts that are currently happening at the EU level, which is also developing a legislative binding uh, framework, so, so Digital Services Act, that also follows a very similar approach. Um, I've now also had a chance to contribute to MSI DIC work, and uh, I'm sure as the guidance as well as the draft recommendation now nice actually complements the previous work that was already done by the group. Also the recommendation on intermediary liability, which significantly informed not only our policy work, but also policy work of many relators and European Union as well. So thank you very much for your excellent work. Um, right now, I think it's only fair to also give space to a representative of those who are actually in the core of this regulatory debate. And those are the platforms or private actors, sometimes also referred to as very large online platforms um, that actually have a, a specific attention of regulators, not only in the EU, uh, but all around the world. And I would like to give the space now to uh, Ms. Caitlin Stewart uh, to tell us more, maybe from the perspective of the uh, private platform, our privately owned platform, and what it is uh, to actually be subject to those regulatory efforts and where you see the positives and negatives of the development, also perhaps when reflecting on the, of the guidance and the draft recommendations. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um... I'll try and keep this short. This is a topic that I could talk for a very, very long time about. Um, I think the, the thing is that, that when we kind of, um, you know, I totally agree with what Natalia was saying about transparency needs to be meaningful and in itself, it's not necessarily an absolute good. You know, there needs to be, you know, considering the purpose and the benefits of that transparency and whether or not it's answering any critical or relevant questions. Um, and Ofcom produced a, a report earlier this year and they, they had a quote in that that said, you know, where does a wise man hide a leaf and it's in the forest. And I think that really just highlights the importance of the, the transparency to be meaningful. Um, so we're always working to do more, um, but there is that kind of question of, of how do we get it to do better? Um, in terms of working with the various regulatory initiatives that are cropping up everywhere, um, I think that there's kind of two camps going on. So there is the, the focus on systems and processes and um, those, those transparency efforts, which work. I mean, it's hard to, to kind of get all the information that regulators want at the speed that they want it, but that is definitely an approach and it aligns with what the um, Council of Europe paper is saying, versus there are still regulatory efforts globally that focuses on individual pieces of content and um, rather than looking at the system as a whole and the focusing on the individual pieces of content results in over enforcement and inhibitation inhibiting on freedom of expression the focusing on processes gives us that space to work on where can we we do better um, so if i think of a, a concrete example something like the european code of practice on disinformation has both efforts it has the kind of qualitative reporting on policies products programs and the partnerships as well as the quantitative reporting, um, which is the outcome based. Um, and there's a number of those kind of efforts cropping up. So in Australia, there's a code of practice that's similar. New Zealand's got a net safe code that's currently under consultation. Um, and I would say these are all very positive developments. I think the challenge for the platform is when you have conflicting efforts within regions 
um, wanting kind of very different things when actually it takes a lot of time, effort and resources to produce the, this kind of transparency reporting. Um, and without that consensus about what should be measured and you know whether or not there's that consensus about how, how to achieve that, that makes that very challenging. Um, and I think also there, there needs to be more consensus that these requirements should really be underpinned by international human rights laws and that can be missing in some regions. Um, but I'll stop there for now. Thank you. And indeed, the contextual dependency in individual regions when it comes to uh, regulating user generated content online is a serious challenge, uh, not only for platforms, but also uh, for regulators and states to come up with responses that actually do not end up violating human rights, but reinforce the protection, especially those who often find themselves in vulnerable position, whether these are human rights defenders or activists uh, or historically oppressed groups. Um, which is actually a good connection to now hear from the representative of state, those who actually sit behind the legislative table and put those measures uh, into practice and uh, oversight the implementation of such measures. So I would like to invite now um, Mr. Ida Yoichi to actually uh, give us more of a state perspective uh, that also will be perhaps uh, informed by his previous work on regulating artificial intelligence. And since content moderation includes from a large uh, perspective, uh, lots of automated decision-making processes, uh, it's quite important to also address uh, machine learning systems and other tools that are being regularly deployed by platforms. Um, so please, uh, the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so good uh, afternoon, good evening. Uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to join uh, this uh, very important uh, session uh, uh, from Tokyo. And so uh, as a government, uh, the balance between the freedom and the uh, security uh, on internet is always very difficult to, and the sensitive uh, uh, issue. And uh, especially in Japan, uh, we put a, a, a very significant importance uh, on protection of uh, privacy and also the secrecy of communication uh, based on the constitu uh, constitution. Uh, from the historical experience, uh, we uh, have a very serious uh, responsibility uh, to protect uh, the communications between private people. And it is always uh, uh, a very difficult uh, problem for uh, telecommunications operators and the internet providers, uh, how to handle uh, the information on the uh, internet, uh, because, you know, they have a very, uh, uh, serious responsibility to protect uh, the uh, information uh, uh, belonging to a private uh, 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 subject. Uh, that means, you know, they cannot see the content of the information and they cannot judge what is uh, right, and what is wrong. So this is a, a kind of, uh, uh, this gives a kind of limitation uh, to, to their actions. Uh, in uh, taking uh, 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 when they, they want to, to uh, respond to harmful information on the network. In our uh, legislation, we have uh, illegal information and uh, legal but harmful information. And uh, when it uh, comes to the uh, illegal information, it is not very difficult. You know, you, 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 we, we need to take away illegal information from the network. But when it comes to the legal but harmful information, this is very, uh, rather complicated. And, and everybody can uh, claim uh, the freedom of expression. And uh, uh, providers and platformers uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, infringe the freedom of expression uh, when, even when the information looks uh, harmful. So there is a, a, a 
a very complicated requirement on how to balance the freedom of expression and uh, security uh, of uh, individual uh, participant in the internet. And so having said this, uh, uh, our system uh, is uh, uh, guaranteeing, uh, 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 basically our system is based on the uh, uh, independent uh, uh, decision-making of uh, individual uh, uh, participants, uh, including uh, platformers and uh, uh, in, uh, internet service providers. So uh, uh, in the case of uh, legal but harmful information, uh, they have to, to judge on their own responsibility. And, and uh, uh, in order to uh, reduce uh, their burden, we had a special uh, legislation to exempt uh, the uh, internet providers from uh, 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 their responsibility to block and uh, take, uh, take down uh, the uh, apparently harmful information, uh, although it is uh, uh, legal. So, uh, Meaningful transparency is very complicated in our system, and uh, when we see uh, more and more harmful information are flowing on internet, uh, the responsibility of uh, providers are getting more and more important, and the uh, social atmosphere is getting more and more serious. Uh, they uh, the uh, citizens are requiring more to uh, private uh, uh, providers. And uh, uh, now the government is uh, uh, thinking of uh, uh, further legislation uh, to create more space for those private uh, uh, players to take uh, actions on their own decision. This is uh, similar to the AI uh, applications uh, by private uh, uh, service providers. Uh, they uh, you, uh, want to use uh, AI applications to, uh, to uh, judge uh, whether the information is legal or illegal or, or uh, whether the information is, uh, uh, can be uh, judged harmful or not harmful. They can uh, use a kind of application to 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 uh, uh, to know uh, what is uh, 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 some specific information can be uh, harmful or not harmful. But uh, in, in, uh, they uh, are always uh, uh, those uh, private players are always required to to guarantee some transparency and uh, it is, uh, they are a little reluctant to, to use uh, AI applications uh, on their own uh, responsibility. And there is, uh, we need more uh, discussion and more, uh, 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 more uh, exploration uh, on, common uh, understanding uh, among uh, uh, business players and the citizens uh, on what uh, can be uh, harmful, what can be uh, admitted uh, in, in the uh, internet society. So that's uh, the uh, Japanese situation and from the government, it's uh, the situation is always uh, uh, fluctuating and uh, moving. So uh, we need to, to look at the, the, uh, 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 the requirement from the uh, civil society and we need to, to discuss the matter uh, in multi-stakeholder uh, 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 participation and we need to, to foster the uh, uh, common understanding uh, uh, with all uh, participants uh, in the net, uh, internet society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and indeed, uh, it is always, and it's been a widely observed challenge to establish clear distinction between content that is 
illegal uh, or manifestly illegal, irrespective of its context, which is the term that was actually widely developed and used by the Council of Europe as well, and the work of MSI that um, and also uh, potential ha potentially harmful but legal content. And we, as civil societies, were, of course, fighting against many vaguely defined categories of user-generated content to be subject to legally binding regulation, uh, since we know out of experience how vague terminology can actually have detrimental impact for human rights. Um, but we hear a lot about the meaningful transparency standards. And uh, Matthias, uh, you're the last, uh, but not least, of the speakers today. So I would like to also touch the ground on what actually is meaningful transparency. And we will address this issue further because we will also have a follow-up questions for our speakers before we will give the floor to the audience. And maybe just a gentle reminder before we go to Matthias, uh, if you have any comments or questions that you would like to raise and address to our speakers, do not hesitate to post them to Zoom chat and we will make sure that they are being properly addressed if there's enough time and space for that. And we will do our best that there will be. Uh, so Matthias, over to you. There is a lot about meaningful transparency and data access framework that should be granted to vetted researchers and civil society. That provision now also exists in the legislative proposal at the EU level. Uh, if you could elaborate on that one and how important it is that this is actually now or will be in the future legally mandated and that transparency won't remain just some voluntary generosity that platforms show based on some voluntary commitments. Um, so I will step there and over to you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much, Eliska. Uh, it's always a, a true pleasure to, 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 to have you chair, chair any meeting, uh, especially one which I'm involved in. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I I, uh, I do a lot of uh, of, of internet uh, governance and platform research. Um, I deal mostly in norms, but a lot of uh, of my my fellow researchers deal in data, right? And uh, they uh, need uh, access to good quality data from platforms to be able to see. Uh, what um, problems uh, can arise and are arising uh, uh, during during the, the the practice of of content uh, governance? While in the past um, a lot of research um, has been conducted on the basis of of, of data access that was uh, that was freely freely given, uh, that that um, that research had certain constraints, namely the ones that the, the platforms that, that provided that data uh, uh, accustomed, uh, th th which, they, which they put onto that the data access. Now, the, the problem in that is not that uh, the platforms are, are, are necessarily uh, uh, not, not to be trusted. However, the problem is that researchers uh, once they are only given a very limited view, uh, might uh, not be able to ask the right questions. Platform researchers have to be able to get as much access to as much data as possible to be able to find the right questions to ask and then to provide um, policymakers with uh, substantial and, uh, and 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 correct and demonstrably true uh, answers. We see that, for instance, uh, when it comes to the field of, of of bot research. The whole field of 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 bot research is is a mess, right? It's a mess because all of the all researchers that try to conduct bot research. Um, unless they truly have access to an internal uh, data on, on bot behavior, have to reconstruct uh, what they think a bot might look like, which leads to the, the problems we, we know about. Uh, the same goes for disinformation research. The same is also true, for instance, regarding the impact of social media on, on children. We, you know, we, we read a lot about those issues in, in the papers, right? But we would so much more as researchers want to be able to provide substantial and um, informed uh, data. Uh, we've seen that, for instance, when it comes to the question of, uh, of the so-called filter bubbles, which don't exist like that, as, as, as has, been, uh, has been demonstrated. But we would have uh, been able to say that much, or being able to dispel the myth of filter bubbles much more easily if data access had been uh, there quicker. So um, I think 
what we need to do is realign, realign the interests of states, researchers, and platforms. And I think that this realignment is laid down both in the current um, in, in the current in the current normative proposals uh, on the basis uh, at the European Union level, and it's also contained importantly in these more recent um, uh, explanatory. Uh, documents which provide ex very important support to uh, a, a, a more vigorous approach to, to data access for researchers. Now, I'm the first one to realize that there are data protection issues, there are privacy issues involved in that, there are anonymization issues, and I know that um, that platform um, uh, that platform platform people will tell me you know it's, it's you, everything is more difficult than you think I recognize that right my data my data researchers always also tell me that things are much more difficult than, than I think um, but I do believe that uh, in weighing the difficulties we can come to a, a good solution um, you know synthetical data for instance has been an issue that's been raised for quite some time we all know that um, there are there that uh, that good solutions um, exist but you first have to be able to ask the right questions and these uh, first um, you know these these um, approaches to a more st st stronger uh, access for, for scientists point exactly into the right uh, into the right direction um, and if, if I may say one last thing um, I think it's so great how much progress we're making. I was involved in the 2016 to the 2018 minister, um, the Committee of uh, Council of Europe minister, uh, Committee of Experts on Internet Intermediaries, and I was rapporteur for the recommendation we wrote then. And rereading that recommendation, I just feel that's it's still nice, but it's legal history, and it's so great how much how much has happened in the two or three years. It's so good to have been wrong a bit, you know. Now things are developing, and I think in two or three years, when we look back at those debates we're having now, you know, how difficult access for scientists is, we'll look back and say, oh, you know, it really wasn't that difficult at all. Let's make that work. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We would love to share your enthusiasm. So let's let's keep our hopes high. Uh, and I very much like the how you uh, use the term platform people, which before we will actually give the space to uh, to the audience, I think it's uh, good if we address few follow up questions in that regard. And by the way, just maybe touching upon the point that Matthias raised around data access framework, not only vetted researchers should have that access, but there is a strong push for also civil societies with relevant expertise having similar access. So let's see whether we will get that from the regulators in the future. Uh, but now going back to you, Kathleen, uh, I, uh, I think that ultimate uh, key to every single measures and provisions that look very good on the paper is a proper oversight mechanism. And whether that's the oversight mechanism for state regulation, co-regulatory measures, but one would argue also for self-regulation that is being deployed by platforms in order to understand what platforms exactly do with the content, uh, what are their response mechanisms, how they also enable effective remedies. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the guidance has some concrete ideas about such a form of oversight. And I would like to hear from you and your reflection, what would be that ideal model that in your opinion, uh, since you are representing a platform today, what would be actually effective? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, this is something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I've come from a, a long history or a long career of regulation and what is missing is this kind of overarching framework of regulatory principles at a, at a global level. So if you look at other regulated industries like medicine, they have the World Health Organization, financial services have regional um, oversight bodies that kind of set up this, this framework that then gets implemented nationally but they all follow then the same principles and then that allows global organizations in in the, and those are all global fields to um have the certainty of of what they're doing and not kind of have to operate with conflicting models between one country and, and another um and so international oversight where you have I'd say a framework that at a, at a global level and, and obviously you would have um, 
thinking global, acting local, I think would, would probably be, be the mechanism there that would work, which is how like medicines, finance, telecoms all, all tend to work. Um, and so far that that is missing. Um, the closest we've seen to it is the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, which is an industry led um, effort, but they've set out kind of five principles and 35 best practices at that high level that is both content and technology and platform agnostic. And that would be the level that would need for that to exist. And it's touched upon in, in the Council of Europe's paper. Um, the main disadvantage with any kind of international oversight like that is the pace at which it, it can react. And, um, you know, the industry that we're in is very fast paced, very fast changing. And so, you know, the challenge would be how do you get some international global principles or oversight that can still have that flexibility for the emerging issues, uh, which I do not have the answer yet. Uh. Thank you. Um, Actually, I might add, it may not be for me to have the answer. I think <laughs> all, all of all of the all of the efforts that have worked very well have been efforts that have involved industry, government, um, civil society and academia. And it's when you get that combination is when you get really good results when you're looking at frameworks. Thank you. Um, I am aware that we are receiving now questions from the audience, uh, but perhaps we we address those. I still would like to go back to Natalie for a moment. Uh, we speak a lot about the role of online platforms and very large online platforms, but of course, one could argue that before we even started discussing the new models of platform governance and how to make them better, there was also a media regulation that significantly perhaps informed the efforts that are still ongoing. And so where do you see the legacy as an expert who actually work on also uh, regulation of media platforms uh, and how that actually translate to today's debates on regulatory approach to uh, online space and, and uh, platform governance. Um, many thanks. Thank you for this uh, challenging question. Um, I think um, I, I had earlier this day a very interesting co uh, conversation also on the uh, European um, new approach, the AI Media Freedom Act. And I think something that we constated there is that a lot of the rules for the media space were written for traditional broadcasting media. And, and personally, I'm very hesitant of um, translating these rules one on one to platforms. And sometimes it is argued that, you know, just expand media concentration laws, just add platforms to the mix. And I think this is really, really complicated because um, the, the sources of, for example, opinion power are very different. The, the dynamics and the processes are very, very different. Um, I think what we um, should do and which what also the recommendation does is to see the issue of regulation of platforms not in the isolation of the bigger context of the media ecosystem in which they are functioning. And, and that is something that we see in, in some of the regulatory efforts that there's a lot of attention for um, yeah, the content moderation and the responsibilities of platforms. But I think what we also really need to look at, and this is a point that the recommendation guidance notes also highlight very much, is how do they fit in this broader ecosystems of media organizations that are subject to, to other rules. Um, so I think that is something important to consider. And as something else, I think we really need to think is, is how to revisit some regulatory concepts, for example, media concentration in the light of, of very yeah, fundamental changes in what media means and, and, and the dynamics and processes in media making and access to media. Um, so this would be my short answer to, to your very complicated question. Um, maybe if I may come back to, to Kathleen, I, uh, on the governance issues, I, I think you're right. This is an enormously uh, complex issue. And, and I, I, I totally see also the importance of, of some approaches of standardization. I think it's 
uh, you mentioned as a challenge the, the, the speed of these processes. And again, I, I very much agree with you on that. Although I would like to highlight that the recommendation was actually a rather swift process. Um, but the second challenge is maybe also um, that, that many values are simply contextual. So I think it is easier to globalize, have global standards for some values than, than others. So I think that is a, um, um, another factor that will keep us busy for the years to come. Thank you. Uh, and now we can actually turn to the questions from the audience. There are actually two questions by the by the same author. Uh, first of all, the first question actually consists of two, uh, and it's relatively long, but very straight to the point. But before I will move to that one, because that's the question for all of you, I would like to first address a question that is being uh, specifically uh, given to um, a state representative today. And the question is, are there ongoing multi-stakeholder processes that are addressing the challenges of illegal harmful content? So illegal and harmful content and broader content moderation challenges as raised by you during your presentation and specifically in the context of Japan. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the uh, very uh, challenging question. Um, yes, uh, the content, uh, no, I, I think the question is asking the uh, situation of uh, uh, content moderation. The question specifically considers uh, whether uh, or is the, 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 the so the question says, are there any ongoing multi stakeholders processes that are actually addressing these challenges? Mm -hmm. So uh, challenges related to combating illegal or potentially harmful but legal content and also perhaps the broader content moderation ch challenges that you also raised during your presentation. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, so. Uh... I take uh, one example, uh, which is now being promoted uh, by a um, global initiative called the GPAI, GPI. Uh, uh, in this framework, um, uh, experts from various uh, countries, uh, from various communities, including legal background, uh, economic background, but also uh, some experts from civil society, and uh, 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 of course, a tech, uh, tech community are joining together and they are discussing how to implement uh, uh, um, trustworthy AI uh, in uh, specific applications. And what uh, they are talking now is uh, how to ensure transparency uh, in content moderation algorithm, which is used by uh, uh, social uh, network uh, provider. So they are working uh, with one of the uh, very big uh, global uh, uh, platforms and uh, 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 analyzing the content moderation algorithm and uh, uh, to to share the common understanding uh, how it's working and uh, how it's uh, judging uh, the uh, individual uh, content, uh, which is uh, harmful, which is not harmful, which can be acceptable, which cannot be acceptable. And uh, uh, this is very important uh, to, to share uh, the understanding and to foster the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, 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 efforts uh, in uh, not only in the content moderation, but also uh, fostering the uh, common understanding in broader sense uh, on what is what can be acceptable for the society, what can be not what can cannot be acceptable for the society. And I believe this can be 
dependent on individual uh, country, individual community, individual society, uh, because you know, in individ uh, each country has its uh, own history and own culture and own background, own situation, and this can be uh, uh, different from one country to another, one country to uh, one community to another. So, I think uh, I. Uh, uh we are uh, as a government we are uh, promoting uh, uh, a kind of uh, common understanding and uh, uh, non-binding uh, principles uh, uh, in uh, for example ai principles or data uh, 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 governance principles and uh, based on that uh, software approach, uh, I think uh, individual uh, country or individual society can build up uh, their own uh, governance system. And this is uh, uh, our basic uh, approach and uh, uh, this uh, uh, example uh, being taken uh, being promoted by uh, GPAI is uh, a very good example uh, for our approach. And we are uh, uh, strongly uh, supporting uh, these efforts by multi stakeholders. Thank you. Um, and now going back to the question, which is addressed to all of Or at least in my view, because it concerns the challenges connected to extraterritorial impact of content moderation decisions conducted by platforms that often decide about content removals based on their terms of service, which then has global impact, uh, and how that actually can potentially conflict with different requirements across jurisdictions around the globe. And also the uh, question then address whether there is any risk of proliferation of extraterritorial take takedowns from, for instance, democratic states, which in turn may, however, empower more authoritarian states to police globally accessible content. And as an example, uh, the NetsDG uh, is mentioned, so infamous, the first of its kind, anti-hate speech law, uh, or, or, or there are other nicknames that how this law was dapped uh, in recent years by press and also by policymakers. Um, and we know that based on those transparency reports uh, that are being required by this regulatory framework, many of these takedowns or the majority of the takedowns are being actually performed based on companies' terms of service and not necessarily based on the state regulation, in this case, uh, German Penal Code. Um, hence, that means that terms of service still take precedence and they often actually determine what will be considered uh, as accessible and um, agreeable online and what on the other hand will be removed from the online space or from the platforms. So is there a risk for such an extraterritorial uh, impact of content removals? And I think it's a very interesting question since we have representative of state, representative of platforms, we have independent academia and other experts. Um, each of you can actually answer this question uh, from your own angle. And perhaps, Matthias, we can start from you this time, because I know that you spend significant time on analyzing NetsDG uh, and its implications, not only for the EU and how it actually shaped some regulatory responses across member states of the European Union, but we know that especially NetsDG had a very big international spillover and inspired many legislative responses in the field of content governance across the world. Uh, so over to you, Matthias. Again, yeah, uh, fascinating, fascinating, multi multi layered question, and I'm not even sure that the net stage would be in the the middle of that question. I think um, if we if we talk about the one case which globally uh, in the last uh, year um, co uh, caused uh, calls for uh, worldwide censorship and fears like that to to come up, that wasn't a German case, right? That was a case in front of the European. Uh, Court of Justice of the European Union coming out of Austria, right? The Glavishnik case. Um, but even though um, lots of uh, lots of tech tech media said this would be the end of the free internet, I mean, if you look around, has anything happened at all? Yes, there was this one case where the European, uh, where the Court of Justice of the European Union said European law does not forbid 
that national courts extend uh, a, a global reach to their judgments, nor does international law forbid that they say it should be applied globally. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating, namely, are those judgments then enforced locally in 192 states? And no, of course, they're not. So legally, the, the, the impact of those, of those, uh, of those single decisions is, is rather limited. However, I think the question, the, 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 the real heart of the question goes rather to the, to, to the other question, namely, do uh, companies nonetheless, perhaps you know, out of fear or perhaps uh, because they're, they, they find it more, more easier, do they still take down uh, uh, content globally based on one national law? And I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see a very, very strong evidence for that happening globally, um, because if we did, uh, we would have we would much have have much much you know much bigger outcry. You know, I, I'm still seeing you know criticism of of uh, of the Turkish president in on Germany's Facebook. Uh, we're still seeing criticism of of Thai politics outside of Thailand. We're still seeing all of those things, uh, and we saw a Holocaust denial on the U.S. Facebook until August, uh, even though a lot of European states uh, have had lots of uh, judgments saying that uh, obviously uh, Holocaust denial is illegal. So I, I get I get the fear, I get the problem, and the the author is an, an excellent researcher uh, working for the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, which of course is developing rules on exactly that question. So they are on the forefront of answering those intricate questions. But I don't see that as the as the the end of the internet is not near, uh, and it won't uh, end because of uh, those those kinds of global jurisdiction questions. Thank you, Matthias, also for bringing a Glavashnik Pieszczek decision back to life. <laughs> and now, uh, Natalie, I would like to hear your your view on on extraterritorial impact of content removals. Yeah, thank you, and also thank you, Matthias, for uh, bringing optimism into this uh, debate, and I fully share that. Um, I, I think that's a very true remark, and it's it's part of a much bigger eternal question, which is not only limited to content moderation, but the fact that media laws are national, and and the technologies we are talking about, and some of the companies we are talking about are operating globally, and I think. Um, what that highlights again is also the importance of a focus on organizing processes um, in, instead of taking uh, the deciding um, uh, on the level of content what what to remove or not and in that context also um, establishing processes of contestability of this decisions so that if a national of a member state uh, finds um, herself infringed in in her rights and again remember that values are, are contextual also depending on the natural cultural setting so i think that we have also processes of contestability so that users can contest take down decisions but not only users and i think that is another important point that the recommendation made. for example news media the recommendation also touches upon the right of news media organizations to contest take down decisions if that interferes with their editorial freedom and I think that is another important component that we don't talk a lot about. It's not only users um, that are affected by these decisions, but sometimes also media and, and, and in their ability to exercise their, their freedom of expression rights. Thank you, very well said. Um, and there is actually follow up from the audience and uh, needless to say, the author of this question is actually Aid Francis, who works for already mentioned Internet Jurisdiction uh, Project. Uh, so uh, just I will read his follow up loud for you, Matthias. Well, I agree with you. Um, and now it, sorry, now it jumped. Uh, about the end of the Internet, state outside the West are catching up with legislation with extraterritorial scope. Um, so uh, that's some remarks from the audience, and we are very grateful for those. You still have the last seven minutes to ask any follow-up questions from our participants, uh, so please don't be shy and post them to the chat. Um, I perhaps would like to still go back to one of the core elements that were mentioned by all speakers, and that seemed to lie or seems to be a priority for not only uh, international organizations, but also civil society players. And I will dig deeper again into the topic of meaningful, meaningful transparency. Um, uh, and also because it's a very important topic and very featured essential element of the guidance that we discussed today, as well as uh, draft recommendations. 
We now have also legislative proposals, so legally binding proposals that actually mandate criteria for meaningful transparency. And I would like to understand better what do you actually envision under that topic uh, as leading experts on this issue and how such a model of meaningful transparency should look like in order to be truly meaningful. I'm also aware that we have last six minutes, uh, so maybe I can start with Kathleen and then uh, let you to also input on the topic and perhaps add your concluding remarks, unless the audience will actually shoot some interesting questions your way still. Okay, I'm um, sorry about earlier, I lost my connectivity for a few moments, so I, I missed some of the, the last uh, question. Um, I think in terms of meaningful transparency, I think there's that kind of risk of numbers for the numbers sake. And when you get into those metrics, regulators then look for year on year improvement without considering kind of wider measures that take place on, on platforms to um, try and increase the soft trust and safety, you know, and those are, are like the tools like, you know, proactive detecting, detect, yeah, proactively detecting, um, routing to reviewers, you know, demotions um, for content that's likely to be violating, all of those sorts of tools which can impact the prevalence of, of um, uh, content that is potentially violating. So I think for meaningful transparency, there is that, that two aspects. It's not just the metrics, but it's also the um, quality of information about the, the system and the processes that are in place around it. Um, otherwise, we're just at this risk of over-regulating and over-enforcing um, on freedom of expression. Thank you. And uh, since we opened this session uh, with the introductory remarks uh, by the uh, chair of the Council of Europe, MSI, the committee that is the author of the guidance that brought us here today, I would like to give the space to Natalie one more time and to perhaps describe uh, in three minutes what is the guidance and recommendations approach to meaningful transparency and what are perhaps the most essential criteria that have to be met in order to make that transparency truly meaningful. Um, and we can also use this as the final concluding remarks of this panel. <laughs> That's a big shoe to put on. Uh, thank you, Erika. Um, let's start with meaningful transparency. The, as, the, as the experts um, and the rapporteurs uh, of the guidance note and the recommendation and, and the entire committee also elaborated on, I think one important aspect to understand there is that we promote transparency not for the sake of transparency. So the point is not simply having more data or having more transparency, but transparency serves a goal, accountability, oversight, the ability to exercise choices. And something that um, the MSI DIG has tried to work out in its recommendations is also that we need not only to look at making this information available, but helping and creating the conditions so that this information then can be translated into action. Um, so to give you a very concrete example, um, the data access provisions that uh, Matthias has also been talking about, I think it's a major step forward that this is now entering um, a more serious uh, state of uh, negotiation and even legal text. Um, but again, access to data is only the very first step to meaningful transparency. In order to really make this transparency meaningful, we also need to create a condition so that researchers can fulfill this role in terms of, of funding, in terms of recognition and rewards, but also in terms of making sure that the insights from this research then actually do indeed reach regulators and platforms. So um, accordingly, the, the recommendation, for example, has not only developed elaborate guidelines on access to data, but also calls on member states to fund and promote rigorous and independent research and create these conditions, that transparency can be turned into meaningful oversight. And, and I think that is an um, important um, takeaway. Thank you. Many thanks. And uh, we definitely second the idea of sort of tiered approach to transparency in order to make it truly meaningful. Um, uh, so I think we are very much at the end. 
uh, I would like to uh, express my gratitude again to all amazing panelists and their great viewpoints that they shared with us today. And perhaps to also use uh, Matthias's kind of positive framing uh, from his initial contribution three years ago or a few years back, uh, there were many sort of goals and ideals that we wanted to see uh, within the regulation or guidance or any other tools uh, in order to establish some due diligence safeguards and other responsibilities on platforms. Today, we actually have the real drafts. We have documents such as the guidance notes, uh, draft recommendations, and the, uh, the, the quest for that ideal model of platform governance still continues. And uh, perhaps instead of being worried uh, whether this is the end of internet or whether what kind of disasters are coming our way, uh, let's reflect on uh, where the regulation will actually stand in five years and perhaps indeed we can achieve that human rights centric regulatory response to many issues that we are currently battling, whether at state re level, uh, state regulation level, co-regulation or sub-regulation. Thank you very much again to everyone for being here tonight uh, and we will definitely stay in touch. Have a good evening. <laughs>